All right, welcome back to another episode of Small Business Chronicles, where we hear stories from businesses, small, medium, large, and I am your co-host, Brian Stone. I'm serial entrepreneur, and I am so excited to talk to our guest today. Number one, we have a lot in common, um, and the first of which being our name. I'm actually uh, talking with Brian Lang. He's all the way from Austin, Texas, um, and he is... He is uh, all about numbers, and that doesn't sound super exciting to most people that uh, that I chat with, but trust me, don't turn off this episode. You're going to hear some great tips. We're going to talk about how to grow wealth um, and what Brian does to make sure that he's uh, serving his clients well. We're also going to talk about how he's learning to grow and scale and how to say no to the business um, if, it's, if it's the right time to say no. So I'm excited to get into it. Uh, Brian, how are you today? I am doing awesome. How are you, my man? Good, man. Good. Look, we have a lot of common. I know that we're going to have a great conversation. We're both real estate investors. You know, we both are familiar with that space. And, um, you know, um, I have a background on you, Brian, but but I always like to start for our, our listeners' benefit with you telling us why they should be so excited about uh, the conversation uh, and, and, and tell them a little bit about what you do, what your company is, and, and where you're at today. Yeah, cool. Uh, yeah, so if you were just getting 60 second elevator pitch on our company, right? Like, first of all, Brian Lang, I'm in Austin, Texas. I'm the uh, CEO, founder of Upside CFO. And you'll find out on this call, like, I'm a huge number store, right? Numbers are critical to growing wealth. You got to know that stuff, whether you want to or not. And essentially, what we do for our clients is we have uh, three arms we do outsource CFO work, tax planning, and then we also help people with financial planning, asset management type stuff. And essentially what we're trying to do is we teach business owners, how do they use numbers to uh, make strategic decisions and increase their cash and profits? And, you know, typically, you know, numbers vary, right? Typically we're increasing cash and profits with clients by about 10% or more. And I can harp on tax efficiency all day long. I don't consider myself a tax CPA, but damn, it is important. We're always saving people you know, ten, twenty thousand dollars a year. I just did a tax plan for someone, depending on their risk strategy, low end two hundred thousand dollars a year, high end six hundred thousand dollars a year in taxes. We will save them. You know, you you amplify that over a ten year period of time, twenty year period of time. You're talking a hell of a lot of money and wealth back in your pocket. And then lastly, um, you know, people have to have some sort of financial plan. I'm not necessarily the biggest fan of financial planners in the world, even though one of them is a mentor of mine. He's awesome. And there's a ton of good ones. Uh, but I, I think you have to kind of uh, watch what you're doing on that side. And I have learned there are a lot of hidden fees in some of those products. So you want to make sure you're you're working with someone who is aware of that and kind of aligned to what you're trying to accomplish. Well, I mean, let's 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 be real, Brian. Like, uh, tr- truthfully, the, the and I read the I forget which article I read on this, but these I, I, it said that the single most impactful um, um, thing in your long term retirement planning is who is actually managing those funds. Yep. Because of the hidden fees, because of their 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 take that they get out of it. It's it's not what you invest in. It's not you know um, what vehicle it is. It's who's actually doing the management of it because. Those fees can eat you alive. They really can. Yeah, and and you will never see me pretend to play financial planner. I am not one. I know enough to be dangerous. Uh, we have a company we rev share. We work very closely with. I learned all my tax knowledge from them, quite frankly. It's kind of like a mentor relationship almost. And they are really skilled at... They, we do a taxes first, then math analysis where they take all your data and they can point out what the holding costs are, the fee structure... And we've been doing this about 12, 18 months. It has been a very eye-opening experience to see how many hidden fees exist out there that people just have no idea, right? We had a lady recently, um, and she she has a decent amount of assets under management. We only saw half. She's ended up paying about 84 k a year to her financial planner and the he- hidden fee cost. We think realistically that should be more in like the 55K range and, you know, same principle, right? Okay. It sounds 30K. Maybe they do a great job or other, other services, but compounding over time, that's going to turn into millions of dollars. I mean, if they don't make her more than that 30K, um, then, then it's not worth it. Right. Exactly. I mean, and, and, and listen, I, you know, I for and I know that you're not saying this, Brian, but I want to clarify. We're not saying there's a problem with people being paid to manage um, assets. I mean, that's that, that's that's not the issue. The issue is 
are do they have the right strategy that fits you? Or are they putting you there in just a cookie cutter mold um, just to just to to collect you know their their piece of it? Right. I mean, are are they being a fiduciary right. as they should be to make sure that you're getting a return on investment? Right. Yeah, and one thing that's interesting in this space, and and don't take this as an attack on financial planners. I know a lot of them; they're great people. They care. They have a high give a shit factor. Like they do a good job for their clients. But let's say you're one that grew up in a firm, and you know you're a little younger in your career, and maybe you don't know how to decipher all this yet. If your company only sells ten or twelve products, and all ten or twelve products of those are high commission vehicles to the company, what? They got to eat and make money, right? Like they're going to sell yeah. those 10 or 12 products and they might not even realize they're high commission depending where they are in their career. So yeah. like I said, it, it's just been a very eye-opening experience for me, kind of peeling yeah. the onion back on that side. Well, and and yeah, sorry to go down that rabbit hole, but I mean, I think, uh, and we've talked about this um, on this platform before, but there's a difference between someone who manages your books and someone who actually advises you and consults you on a tax strategy. Yeah. And it's important to know the difference and have both. You know, to be honest. So, um, well, you know, you've learned a lot along the way. Um, but, but tell me a little bit about, but why? Why did you get into uh, into this space? Like, what drew you into um, being where you're at now? You got what six employees? You guys have been uh, had. You've had a great growth trajectory uh, thus far. But what's what? What drew you into this space? Yeah. So <clears throat> I think part of this, I've, I've always been kind of a numbers dork. Like when I was a, a little kid play, I was really good at sports. I used to play like Nintendo video games. Right. And I had this little green notebook and I would like record all these stats and do this analysis and all that stuff. So I've always been into this stuff. Uh, and then I had a, a cousin and it, it's kind of, I have a huge family and my mom's one of 11. So I have like 30 first cousins on one side. I have a cousin who's 12 years older than me. He started a business pretty early on in his life. And, you know, the the outside cur curtain that you kind of saw, I'm like, man, this is awesome owning your own business. He plays golf all the time. He makes good money. He's always dicking around. And then obviously when you start your own business, you realize that is not the case of what he was doing. Sure. Uh, so I always kind of wanted to own my own business. I worked in big corporate a long time. And then, you know, I had quite frankly, an amazing corporate job. You know, people thought I was crazy to walk away. And I'm just like, I hate this so much. This is not what I want to do with my life. And I was, I don't know, probably mid thirties. And I kind of went solo consulting on myself. Um, had some, still some of the most income I've ever made is when I was solo consulting. And that was both good and bad. It was great on the income side. And I, you know, had a, maybe a little bit of an ego, let's say, right? Like all I was really doing was trading time for money. Um, mm. I, I was not a business owner at that time and realized like, Hey, I want to own a business at some point. Right. So when I started, um, switching that into a business, I realized that is a hell of a lot harder than just being a one man consultant. So I always, uh, like I said, always kind of like numbers, accounting, finance, tax, all of that stuff. And I felt like at the time I noticed a lot of business owners just weren't aware of their numbers. So, you know, I was like, all right, we're going to start a bookkeeping business. We're going to get an outsourced team in India, be able to compete with everyone on the price. I kind of joked we were going to call it shitty books and, uh, you know, thought we'd have this awesome scalable model and realized quickly I was like, man, do I not want to be a low cost uh, leader by any means. So uh, I, 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 I love that, Brian. I, I, listen, I, um, so many people feel like that's the game to play and it is for some. I mean, let's see. Let, it is for some, but I. But it's not what people think it is, right? When right. they get into it, if you want to talk about trading time for money. Um, you've just devalued your time unless you are yep. really dialed in on your infrastructure right. and you're really scaled well to leverage a lot of the things that are are yep. taking your time away. And I have no problem telling people I am not good enough at process to have that model. In my experience, most <laughs> aren't. You know, if they can, more power to them, right? But quickly realize that's not something I want to be in. So, and then love we it, ended up. And... Oh, oh, go, yeah, ahead, go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. So then we ended up, it's like, okay, how do we use this thing up here to um, our knowledge to, to tap into a little uh, higher profit margin for us, right? And better value to the client. So we ultimately kind of morphed into the CFO side. And then over time, I've been a CPA forever, but to be honest, I still don't consider myself a tax CPA. Uh, but I happen to, I, I'm, I'm 42 as we're doing this. 
I happen to be really good at finding some of the older gray haired guys who are just truly experts and are nice enough to drop some nuggets for you and or mentor you. So I have two folks, one out of California, one out of Cincinnati. The guy out of Cincinnati is probably one of the brightest tax attorneys I ever met. And, you know, I worked at the fifth largest um, accounting firm for seven years and, uh, you know, have just learned so much from those two individuals. And as a result, have just gotten really, really crisp on the tax planning side as well. So we're still figuring out a little bit who we want to be when we grow up, but I feel like we're like 90% there now. Well, and, and um, I, we talked about something before we actually pushed live that I want to bring up. You talked about scaling, right? And you talked about if you had been in this position when you were when you were thirty, right? So ten, you know, a decade ago, uh, uh, you, it would be a totally different story. You'd be taking any piece of business that said yes, right? So tell me a little bit about why it's different now than what it would have been, because I think that this is something that a lot of our uh, our uh, business owners out there, um, <laughs> you know, experience, and it's a pitfall for a lot of people. So wow. so tell me a little bit more about why you're making that decision. Yeah. So first, I think we can break that down into two components. I mean, let's be real, Brian, right? Like when you're first starting your business, you got to eat, right? You got to put a roof over your head. Um, You're excited with any revenue, you know, when you're 100, 200, 300, 500 K a year in revenue, whatever the number is, it's like, yes, just landed a client. You know, you get so excited no matter what the client is. Mm -hmm. Uh, So there is that component, you know, depending where people are in their journey, you get, you got to eat, pay the bills, right? But as you get up and start to scale and, you know, whatever those numbers for you, whether it's a million or three or five million revenue, there's a point where you have to scale in a correct manner. And like I said, I I just know for me personally, if I would have started this when, you know, decade plus ago, we'd be significantly larger in revenue. Um, But I know if you looked behind the curtain, we would be pure chaos. And I actually have a... uh, a friend, their company is about, they're, they're a little similar to what we do. They're about 3x our revenue. And I, I know if I look behind that curtain, it's a, it's a lot uglier than what the outward facing projects, right? Because they, they are constantly adding new employees and just taking on everyone. Um, well, and, and honestly, either, either they're suffering in profit or uh, they're suffering in, in, in time, right? In mm-hmm. time input. Uh, for the sake of of remaining profitable, either one is not the end goal for anyone in business, right? Right. You don't. I mean, you, you don't. You don't want to. It, it 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 takes you all the way back to that. You know, you mentioned when you were solo. Yeah, some of the best money you ever made, but but you were trading your time for money, and yep. and I think that can happen at scale too, if you don't have the infrastructure. Right. So yeah. So and that's. It, wherever anyone is in their journey, you're always kind of tweaking and learning that, right? So I, I, I say, like last week, I had three clients on the tax side where if that would have been two years ago, I would have been like, man, these are awesome clients, right? And one of my next things, maybe if I was a better business owner right now, I would be figuring out how to monetize with more formal referral channels a little better, which we're starting to do. But you know, I rejected those three clients. And just two years ago, I would have thought they were great. And now it's like, uh, you know, they don't quite fit our criteria. And like I said, I know my top line number is not going to be as sexy and it still feels un-American to turn down revenue. You know, like I, lots of times I'm like, am I doing the right thing here? But I want a little, you know, I have three small kids. I, I, I don't want to grind 60 and 70 hours a week. Right. Um, I want to be able to have a business and be engaged in the family life. So I have to be strategic on what we're willing to take. And like I said, it it, it takes some discipline to do that and some patience. I'm going to challenge you on that though, Brian, because um, I think that is absolutely uh, uh, American. I wouldn't say it's not American because, uh, I mean, let's let's be honest. That just means that you you understand enough about your business to know who your ideal client is, yeah. and if that's not your ideal client, then chances are they're probably there's probably somebody else that's a better fit for them, right? Yeah. And you be doing them a disservice by um, by by setting them up to 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 be with you just for for the purpose of you having revenue when they're better off with somebody that is more streamlined more for their bracket whatever the criteria is you know right and i and i found too you know um 
I mean, I'm sure some people in the audience can relate to this, right? You, I'm sure you can too, owning businesses. When you make that exception, it's always like you kind of talk yourself into it, like it's okay for like the first six months or whatever the period of time is. And then, you know, I feel like you hit that year or 18 month or whatever happens, right? And it's just like, why the hell did I do this? Like, I knew better than that. I shouldn't have taken them, you know, lesson learned. Well, and, and you don't have the clients in front of you yet, but guaranteed that taking that one client that's not a fit <laughs> is going to prevent you from having the time to take on three that are. Yep. And that's that's just that's just truth, right? That's just a business truth that we see. Um, you are, anytime you're giving out your time, you don't get any more of it, right, Brian? So if mm -hmm. you're giving that time and it's incongruent, with what uh, you need to be doing, then it's taking it away from people that, that haven't given you the opportunity yet. And you probably won't even see it when it's in front of you because you're too busy running around trying to make a, uh, a square peg fit in a round hole. Right. Agreed. So love it. So, um, so, so you, so you're growing, you're scaling, you're saying no to the right kind of business, saying yes to the right kind of business. Um, it, what's the biggest lesson that you think you've learned along the way that, that, that applies to other business owners that are listening that are maybe in that pain point, they're in that tipping point where they could go really big or they could dial in their systems. I mean, what's your recommendation for them? Yeah. So yeah, I mean, there's so many things I've learned along the way. Right. And then I also love what we do for a living. We see clients that are more successful than us. Right. So I see, good things they're doing, bad things they're doing. You know, I'm just constantly learning. And at least where we are in a company right now, um, one thing that's kind of critical for us, and I admit I'm not the best on processes. So I finally have two folks on my team that are, are you know, quite frankly, they don't necessarily have like the financial background, but damn, they're good at processes and have just been such an amazing fit and blessing to the company, right? So I feel like I have used the term framework with my team more in the last eight weeks than I have in the last four years. And I don't even think I really knew what a framework was, to be honest. And as an example of a framework, like on our CFO services, some of these are a little more customized. Um, you know, we can have a framework that outlines how to do it, but each client is unique. You know, we're a bit of a generalist. We haven't niched yet. And so, so there's a lot of thought process that goes into my head into each client. And because we don't have those frameworks in place, like this was actually kind of disturbing to me. And what I mean by a framework on, let's just say like CFO, you know, we have different phases, right? Maybe we need to validate the data first. Then we kind of focus on the first problem and, hey, we're going to knock this out in the next 90 days. And then explaining to the client what's going to happen next and after that. So we just had a client, we just got terminated, um, you know, great relationship, both sides. We ended up, and I actually wrote notes here on this. So they de they were about 10 million in revenue. They decreased in sales a small amount working with us. Like 2023 had a little bit of a decrease for them, just say two, 3%. Their net income or profit to the owners increased by $1.2 million. Now they were a $4,500 a month client. My team lead on that. Basically all she did all year was help them focus on gross margin which is revenue less cost of goods sold. They had a bunch of labor inefficiency. I won't bore everyone with the detail, but she basically made them an extra $1.2 million. They terminated us and didn't renew. <laughs> and that's because we don't have those frameworks in place, right? Like saying, what is next? What are we going to do next? Because I know if we, maybe we want to get that high of a return the next year for them, but I think they still have another minimum five to 10% of efficiency to gain and without having those frameworks in place, you know, we really w didn't convey our value. Well, and, and, and this is the economy, let's be honest, to where you have to know your value, right? I don't mm -hmm. care what industry you're in. Um, things are getting faster. There's, there, there are industry disruptors that are, that are entering the marketplace in every sector on a, a daily and weekly basis, right? And, um, they're, they're, they're coming to disrupt, disrupt those industries. So if you don't know your value, then you're, you're, you're going to be irrelevant in the business world. You're, you're, you're simply going to be irrelevant. And that's, I mean, I don't think that's any, that I don't think any, I know a single business owner that wants to be, uh, irrelevant. Right. So, um, how do you, um, 
how do you how do you how do you go from um, you know building that framework to 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 maintain it? Is it client communication? Uh, is that what's missing? Is it um, is it just showing your work? Right. I know that's that's a lot of what I've talked about with my team is like how how do we show our work so that uh, they're not because I, I I think a lot of business owners you know make the the mistake of thinking that their client knows their process. And because it's what we do every day, right? So, so what, what are you doing to establish that framework to make sure that you don't have have clients that you lose that you shouldn't? Yeah, and, and I would say uh, just observing, and this includes observing our clients, right? Like in professional mm-hmm. services, I think this is an overall issue. And I was talking with my business coach, and I have been talking about this quite a bit. And she was funny. She she basically told me the other day, you know, and she does more of a coaching. And fi- finally, I was like. Alicia, no bullshit. Like what you got? And she's like, you guys have a marketing problem. And I was like, well, we could get a couple more leads. She's like, no, not marketing like that. She's like, think of marketing as everything. Like your customer journey. You're not explaining to the client where they need to go. You guys are being typical accountants and finance people. You're not bragging about your wins. You know, you're doing so much stuff. Is the client aware of that? Are they forgetting about it? You know, are you making people renew yearly as opposed to just having this permanent retainer? You know, like I said, in the phases, right? You need to market your phases. Phase one, we are complete. What did we learn? What can we do better? Client, did you have an issue with us on communication or anything that could be improved? Okay, now we're moving into phase two, right? Um, So I would say overall, we have a couple components. There is one just documenting processes, making sure we're clear. And that's kind of where we are in this stage of company life cycle and growth, right? Um, And then another thing, this is the first year me personally have kind of worked myself out of the business. You know, I'm in a ton of entrepreneur groups. I talk to business owners all the time. I naturally know how to flow those conversations. And I don't want to say dangle a carrot in, in like a unscrupulous way, but you know, I, I'm showing them what's next just naturally. Where, you know, sometimes, especially if you're a, a good technician, you need to realize and understand your team might not do that naturally and or have that knowledge base and you have to train around that. So that's one of the things we're working on too, is training, you know, scripting through phases. What do we need to think about what's next? So that's, that's what we're working on this year. So I'm glad you mentioned that, Brian, because I was talking to an operational expert uh, uh, about that very same thing. And, you know, one of the tools that she said that she implements is Loom, you know, and, and I think that um, if you are a really good technician, to your point, a lot of times um, you're really good at doing the work and your your first inclination instead of to teach somebody else your process is to just get it done yourself. Yep. And so it, it doesn't have to be that you have to be the best facilitator in the world. Just download Loom. It's super easy. Do a screen record and literally just record it while you're doing it for a client. It doesn't have to be some fake scenario. Don't make the mistake of feeling like you have to be you know, a, a, a professor, right? Just capture what you're doing for your team and then drop that link uh, to the library on the task itself and whatever work management system you have. And boom, you have a, a, a very rudimentary, but at least you have a training manual of some kind, right? It yeah, that, that's, complicated. A, that's an awesome point, Brian. And, and funny you mentioned that. We I actually just, um, one of the things I mentioned, our, our, my assistant's moving in an ops role, And we were kind of talking about this, just, I I fit more of the, and you know, I own a bunch of real estate too. I'm not like a stereotypical accountant, if you will, where I'm kind of connect with business owners a little better on the entrepreneur side. So I tried to get our team, like, I'm like, guys, my brain works like our clients, right? Like I'm a business owner. I don't have the accountant brain and trying to teach them how to do that. And one of the things we're doing is like when I'm in my EO meetings or whatever, I'm going to try to start screen recording right when I get back, like, okay, what did I learn today? You know, so our team gets aware of like, what is it like to be in the head of a business owner? You know, what are some things that may have been talked about or discussed? You know, obviously, if it's confidential, I want to get brought up, right? But, you know, just kind of those overall themes so they can understand that a little better. And as a result, do a little more um, effective job kind of on the connection side of things. Well, and, and, and let's be honest, uh, uh, this is true for owners and CEOs, but it's true of every role as well. Like if you if you make yourself 
uh, the gatekeeper of a certain process or system and you hold it really tight, which I, I, I saw in the corporate world a lot. I'm sure you saw this too, right? People hang on to that. They feel like they're making themselves indispensable and all that's actually happening, happening is they're making themselves unpromotable, right? Because if you can't, you know, uh, uh, like if you can't have your systems dialed in to where somebody else can step in and do them, maybe not as efficiently, right? But step in and do them to make sure it's it's done. You can't take a vacation. You can't, you're not allowed to be sick. You're not allowed to go have a kid. You're not, I mean, I mean that that's, that's not how people's lives work. So you got to be able to scale. And on the, on the CEO side in the small business world, right? Like most of our clients are about 3 million to 20 million in revenue. We have a couple that are a little larger, but if, if you're the business owner doing that, you know, obviously you don't have the promotion risks, right? You're making yourself unscalable. And I mean, we have a client, um, right now where we have ourselves on the CFO and tax side, someone we work cl closely with on the accounting side and the client, I mean, they they have such a high profit margin. We've been working with them about a year, you know, they just went to nine to 12 million profit will be over three, 4 million. And they have such a small team and they are the biggest bottlenecks. And we have been working a year to fit to, I feel like we're, we're almost like going backwards now. You know, we keep having to have come to Jesus meetings and, you know, both the professional service provider size are getting frustrated. So hopefully I think we can kind of work this out, but it's just like, if you guys removed yourself as the bottleneck, like what could you achieve? Would you already be at 15 or 18 or 25 million? Like they're going to crush it. You can tell. Um, I mean, that's not a bottleneck, Brian. That's a knot. That is a gnarly <laughs> knot that's frayed, that's been sitting in the water. That I mean, and the higher revenue <laughs> you are, uh, the the tighter that knot gets pulled and mm -hmm. strained. And so it takes it takes a lot of time and effort, and sometimes hiring a professional like yourself to get that unwound. You yep. know. Well, look, I know that uh, I know we could sit here and talk business all day long. Uh, we share the same name. Obviously, we share a lot of the same opinions, so we get along really well. But we are getting close to, closer to the end of our time. So I want to make sure that I you know, give you an opportunity to let our listeners know um, where to find out more about you, where to connect with you, where to see uh, your services if they're interested in reaching out. Um, so, so tell them uh, the best way to do that. Yeah, so for sure. I'm relatively active on LinkedIn. Um, Brian Lang on LinkedIn, you'll be able to find me. Um, and then just UpsideCFO.com uh, is our website. We have, I take all our calls off our website. So there's a quick, you know, 15 minute intro call on that. So if anyone ever wants to chat with me, happy to. And then we're, um, one thing we're working on this year, if it's useful to any folks out there, is is we're starting to niche and scale a little more. We're starting to get a lot more active on real estate agents. And then kind of the second half of this year, we're going to start launching some more financial education to kind of help them out for some of the gaps we've seen in our existing clients. So that'll be on the uh, back end of this year if there's any real estate agents listening out there. Well, and, and I, obviously I'm a real estate agent myself. And so uh, I'll be looking forward to, you know, hearing more and we'll stay in contact. And, you know, I may even have you on, on one of our real estate shows because I actually host a real estate show uh, as well uh, that is geared toward agents because, yeah, I, as, a, as a real estate uh, business coach myself, I will tell you yep. there is a lot of opportunity for uh, yeah. um, profitability um, yep. because there's, there's the lack thereof present in that right. industry for sure so awesome awesome well um thank you for that brian again thank you for your time um and and guys if you if you're listening to this show and and you have really enjoyed it make sure you connect with brian uh make sure you do all the podcast stuff like us re review us uh shoot me a message if you if you enjoyed it loved it hated it all that stuff and tune in for more fantastic um episodes of small business chronicles where we 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 talk about the stories of business. Let's be honest. Any business, no matter how small, has a story to tell. And that's what this podcast and this platform is all about. So really appreciate Brian sharing his story. And if you guys want to connect with us, you guys know how to do that. So until next time, it's Brian Stone signing off. And um, we'll see you next time.